the bag work about of apartment Fuck. B, 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 B. You're now tuned into the Apartment 5B podcast, where we chop it up about hip-hop, R&B, sports, love and life. Hosted by Kill. 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 What's good, what's good, what's good? Y'all tune into the Apartment 5B podcast, but this is the Book of Rhymes version. So it's not only hosted by yourself, myself, your man Kill. I got my homegirl Porsche with me tonight. What's good, Porsche? How's it going? Uh chilling, chilling, chilling. So, and more importantly, I got my homegirl, my cousin, my cousin, Joanna, out of Brooklyn, New York. What's going on, miss? What's up, Brooklyn? All day, <laughs> day. All right. Now, for everybody out there who's normally tuned in for our hip hop discussion, they're still here. Everything is still there. But one thing that's always been dear to my heart since about 97 is reading. Um, and one of the things I realized is um, I haven't been reading a lot lately. I mean, I guess I blame the phone and the Internet and all this social media. I'm on there more. My attention span is harder for me to get through. So uh, I reached out to poor shops like I need some accountability. We need to. Do something so I know I'm going to read. Because I wouldn't have got through this book if it wasn't for y'all. Truth be told, there's no way in the world it was going to happen without knowing I had to do this show. So that's one of the reasons why I'm going to do this show. And even back when I did Strictly Hip Hop in Baltimore back in 97 to promote literacy, for a lot of people may not know Baltimore, one of the big things is if for some reason it was like the city that doesn't read. So throughout Baltimore, you'll see a lot of bus stops, the city that reads, the city that reads. Um, and to try to promote that, we started doing things on Strictly Hip Hop, like, um, you know, if you could name an album that was based off of a book title or something like that, you know, we had different giveaways and prizes and stuff like that. So we started the Strictly Hip Hop book list. Um, it got big enough so that we invited down to the Baltimore Book Fair. And the one thing that I can say about that experience that really changed how I look at when you have shows like this is you think you know who your listeners are, but you really have no idea. Because when we went to the tent, the crazy thing was only three people in there. So I was like, all right, we failed. This is the worst. And it was a white, a young white couple, probably 19 and 20 ish and an older black woman, probably in her 70s. And I was like, y'all, you know, I'm sorry, y'all probably in the wrong tent. This was strictly hip hop. And they all three of them was like, nah, hell no, kill. We here for you. You know, and it, it shocked me because I would have never thought a 20 something white couple and a 70 year old woman were be listeners of a 90s hip hop show, but they were. So they kind of showed me that, you know, you never know who's listening. Even now with this show, more, I thought it would only be people my age, 43 and older. And it's a bunch of people anywhere from 17 to 35 are probably the bulk of the people who, who watch it. And it's shocking to me because it wasn't made for them. I'm glad they're here. But, you know, I thought this was going to be a place where like old heads will reminisce. But I see it's turning into some place where younger people are able to learn more about hip hop and different things. So since I had this audience, I didn't want to just leave it with hip hop. We wanted to add some books to it. So the first book we're talking about, Annihilation, a new movie that's about to drop. Um, but before we get into this, tell me this, Joanna, how did you get into reading? Because everybody doesn't enjoy reading. I know some people who loathe it, who just can't stand it. My wife, Joanna's cousin, Tanya, is one of them. I can't get her to read a book. She'll read how to do books. She'll read a how to fix something or right. that kind of book. But trying to get her to read a novel, it just doesn't do it for her. So, Joanna, what is it about you that pulled you into books? And when did that happen? So I would say I read everything I could get my hand on starting like at age six or seven. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of books. I went through my like Stephen King phase where I read everything he wrote. I think most people did that. Then I, you know, just read um, a lot of uh, when I went to college, Toni Morrison. I kind of dropped off. And stop. I started doing what you were talking about, not reading like I used to, because I would read at least a book a week. Like it was just like something that I love. It's a way for me to educate myself as a writer. Um, I feel like I needed to read to write more. You know what I mean? And I, I ran into a couple of brick walls as a writer. 
And then you came up with this and I was like, well, why have I stopped reading? This is crazy. This this is probably the cusp of my problem is that I'm <laughs> I'm not reading. Right. Um, and so I'm telling you that it has created, this has really helped me. Reading this book was a little challenging for me, but um, it did provide me with the breakthrough that I needed. And right. I'm writing, you know, now it's a little easier. All right. That's yeah. what's up. So, Porsche, what about you? What got you in the read? Um, yeah, my story is kind of like Joanna's story, actually. I went through a phase where I was reading all the time. I think I, I was reading like Judy Bloom books when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. And I was, yeah, and I was, and I loved those. They were easy reads. I would get through them really quickly. And then again, you know, like MSN Messenger came along at some point, and then books just got pushed to the side, and social media just started happening. and. I kind of got to a point where I felt like, I was like, damn, like my language is not expand. My vocabulary is not expanding anymore. Like I used to be really good with like, you know, words and, and things like that. And now I'm like, damn, like I'm using, like, I, I feel dumbed down. So I was like, okay, I want to start picking up books again. Also, um, when this whole twilight craze thing happened, I was like, a lot of my friends at the time were into it. And I was like, what are you guys doing? This sounds so stupid. And they were like, no, just read it. I read twilight in like a day. I read like each book. It took me literally a day to read them. And I was like, okay, so that got me back on track. Cause I read them back to back um, over like really fast. And then, and then I just started reading again. I love it. I love books. I stay away from nonfiction or I stay away from fiction books now. Um, and I read primarily like nonfiction biographies, um, anything philosophical, um, anything religious sort of just to see kind of what's out there. So I just, I like books in general. So right. that's how my thing was. All right. Well, y'all got dope stories. Cause mine is the complete opposite. I wasn't reading nothing growing up. <laughs> I didn't do any of that. I hated reading. And then in 97, I graduated and I moved down to Atlanta and I met my mentor, Tony Phillips. And this dude was just like, you know, the Yoda, Luke Skywalker. He just saw everything that was, I guess, all the holes in my life and kind of was just like trying to fill them. So he was like, here, read this book. And I was like, nah, B, I don't read books. And he was just like, man, come on. Like, you a black man and you don't read books. You know what I mean? Like, what's wrong with you? And, and just he gave me that book. And um, just ever since then, it just that was it like i was just like y'all and the other thing that kind of took me out of it was i used to commute into dc from maryland so i had a bus and two trains so i was banging out a book a week but then when i started driving to work all that time now got you know that i would spend reading those books i'm now behind the wheel so of course i can't read and that really stopped a lot of um me reading but i have to get back to it um the thing with me and i think the people who love reading is uh, I always believe we have great imaginations. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I don't know about y'all, but when I read, I'm reading a book, I visualize what the characters look like. I, I visualize everything. So I think, you know, some people really don't have a vivid imagination. I think are some of those people who really can't get as much into books and they, but I visualize, you know, everything. And I definitely always love getting into books that were about to become movies because I always wanted to see if, how the director could pull that off. So as soon as I saw the trailer for this, I hit Porsche up, like what y'all think about this for the first book. So let's dive right into it. What Joanna, what did you think about this book? Just the overall, we'll go, I got a lot of questions to get into it, but overall, what what, what did you think about, well, one, let me, let me do this for the people real quick. What is about Area X has been cut off from the rest of the world for decades. Nature has reclaimed the last pieces of human civilization. The first expedition returns with reports of a pristine uh, Edenic landscape. The second expedition is ended in mass suicide. The third in a hail of gunfires as members turned on one another. The members of the 11th expedition returned as shadows of their former selves and within a week all died of cancer. In Annihilation, the first volume of Jeff Vandermeer's Southreach trilogy, we joined the 12th expedition. So it's some crazy world. We don't know what's going on. Everybody who comes back out of this world is not the same. They're sending in the 12th expedition. It's four women. Um, so Joanna, just hearing that, were you interested? Were you peaked? Were you like, ah, this kind of whack, but I'm reading. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I was like, what? I'm not really a science fiction reader. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I saw what the book was about, I was like, God, I'm not really into science fiction, but let me check it out. Um, and I found that 
it was okay. Um, I found a, like a lot of the descriptions um, in him trying to build this world for us, you know, which is one of the things as a writer, I, I think that's why I don't like reading it is because I don't really um, have that skill when I, I when I'm writing, like to build, because you you have to really create all the rules in this world when you're writing. You got to really do a lot of work when you're writing science fiction, and I feel like there was a piece of it missing for me that didn't quite come together in the world. Okay. Um, what the, what those rules were, and you know, I just feel like it. What is it? An alternate universe? Like it was some of it that I didn't quite really piece together um, as to what makes this different than where they live, other than this tower, you know, and this lighthouse. What what you know? What what really stood out for me? Nothing in that regard. However. There were a few things that I really, really found interesting. Um, for, first being that the characters have no names. So I think that's very interesting um, that he, he didn't, they're named by their professions. I think this may have been something that he did intentionally, um, but we know they're all women, which is also something that I think is very interesting that they chose to send uh, all women back out for this expedition. Um, so, I, I, I found that I had some problems with it in some parts. Okay. Um, but overall, I'd say it's a decent read. I really would like to see what the other parts of the, the other books are about. By the way, I got the digital version of the book. I, I can't, I still have to hold the book. Right, right, right. I, I got to hold the book, so. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I was the same when I first got the iPad, I guess, six, seven years ago. I was like, yo, this is great. I could throw all my, my whole library on here. But then after a while, I felt the same way with you. It was, you know, I, just, I just miss holding a book, <laughs> you know what I mean? And just pulling the pages. And, you know, it was definitely convenient to have the iPad and have right. the jump from book to book. But after a while, I was just kind of like, it probably was just technology, something new, like, yo, this is dope. But then it was like, nah, I got to go back to the old school and, and, and just feel a book in my hand. Well, another thing that I'd like to say about this writer, his vocabulary, there were quite a few words in that book that I was like, yeah, that's these, this is, this is, uh, you know, I'm underlining that and looking that up and like, yeah, okay. So that was a, a real a benefit of this book for me is uh, there were a lot of words that were in it that are not usually used in the English language. Very, very, very dense, dense ca uh, vocabulary that I enjoy that. that I like to learn words, so that's fine. All right, that's what's up. Porsche, what about you? When I first hit you with this book, how did you feel about it? Were you pulled in by it? What did you think? Yeah, I wasn't actually, because much like Joanna, I don't read sci-fi really. Um, I, I read it and the reason I don't read sci-fi is because I'm I'm a scaredy cat. I, I, I get scared so fast um, and I'm like, oh God, I got to read this on my own and my own imagination and this is going to get the best of me and oh my God. So I was like, okay, well, we'll make this happen. And I started reading it and like I found it to be, again, similar to Joanna. Um, there was some parts that I was like, wait, what's going on? I had to go back and read a couple times because I missed something or I thought I missed something, but really it just wasn't really touched on. Um, but then I think that a lot of it was really descriptive. Like a lot of the experiences that, that the um, people had was, was descriptive enough that I could get you know, like a visual going on in my own head um, about what was happening. So I, I did enjoy it. I surprisingly enjoyed it more than I thought I would initially. Um, and yeah, I mean, I didn't end up reading the second and third books in the series, which I had initially planned on, but I would probably read them just to see how it goes. Um, yeah. All right. All right, and to me, of course, I was pulled in by, um, I'm in, in, the, in the opposite again, I'm a big sci-fi head. Like, that's probably like one of my favorite genres. I mean, geez, on New Year's Eve, I can watch Twilight Zone. You can keep Twilight Zone on an endless repeat. For, you know what I mean? I watch it, but reading it is something else. <laughs> right, right, you're right. Bro. When I saw the trail, I was like, yo, that, I'm always in the concepts, like even with hip hop, like if, you know, Jay Roo's One Day, like the concept of One Day or just any time that there's a concept. So I was like, yo, OK, a world where people keep coming out crazy going into it. I think I enjoyed the book, but just like you two, there were parts where I kind of 
it was kind of slow to me at times. And I'm one of those personalities who likes to know why. You know what I mean? And I think, um, to me, by the end of the book, I still didn't figure out why. You know what I mean? And for me, it was like, I was like, you two, like, maybe I should go into the second book. Because for people watching, it's actually a trilogy of books. It's Annihilation, Authority, and then Acceptance. But from what I've learned doing the research, Authority kind of just focuses on the Southern Reach, which is the name of the uh, government that, uh, like, the government crew that keeps sending these expeditions in. So... The two books really don't follow on to these characters. It just kind of breaks down the Southern Reach. And then the third book, um, Acceptance, goes into where Area X comes from. So like the characters that we have in this book, they end in this book. And then the other two books go on to, to talk about other things. But I'm also realizing that there are people who really enjoy not knowing why. You know, and I think that this is one of those books where it's just like, you don't know why it kind of just happened and you know kind of like y'all make up you know whatever you decide kind of happens from it but yeah after a while there was times when the book got slow to me i was kind of like all right let me put this down it's only 200 pages and 200 pages back in my glory day i would have banged this out on my lunch break and right. You, know, right, you know what i mean and back in my good old days this 200 pages was like nothing you know when i first sent it out i was like yo we could bang through all three of these books you know you know, but it kind of did get slow to me at times. But let me ask y'all this: going into some of the characters, uh, the psychologist, what did y'all think about her? Because she was hypnotizing the other two people, the, the other three. Did you think that that was happening because she was a bad person? Like I couldn't decide whether she was bad or did did the Southern Reach want her to hypnotize these people to see certain things? What was y'all take on? The psychologist was she a bad guy, good guy, or what? What did you think, Joanna? I think she was a, a, a bad guy. I felt like she was an operative of the government, and she was put there uh, so she could, you know, they have strictly things that they want them to do and look at and behave. Uh, she was there to control everybody else. Um, so, I, in that respect, I saw her as a bad guy, <laughs> you know, because she, you know. You, you're you're there under false pretenses. She's there under right. false pretenses as a spy, um, and in a, in a way, in the sense of the word. Um, I, I again, what you said earlier about needing to know why, you know, this is a, a main piece, like you said, that's missing. And you know, as a, you know, what is the motivation for the character? Why? Why are they go? Why do they go? We don't know why the other guy, people show up, but we know why the person who's narrating it goes because of her husband and her backstory. You know that I think made it interesting to hear that. But the psychologist, I really didn't get. I assumed that she was there and she was a plant, you know, put there. But uh, what motivated her to do that? We never know. And right. I think that that's what really makes you understand a character is when you know where they are coming from. You right. know, what, what makes them do things. Right, right, right. And why do you think the biologist who was the narrator wasn't, she couldn't hypnotize her? You know, that's a good question. I, you know, because she was never able to hypnotize her. Right. But, you know, and, and then she had the... the um, what was that thing called where she had inhaled the spores and the spores made yeah. her, uh, I don't know why, you know, maybe she was missing a quality that the other two didn't have. Maybe the fact that she was motivated to go on this journey in search of answers for her husband kept her from being hypnotized. Okay. You know, yeah. I don't know. That was a good one. Good question. All right, all right. What about you, Portia? What do you think? Did you think the the psychologist was playing? A, she was doing the the undercover John, and why you think the bio yeah? So I like it's so weird because when I read this, I I was trying to be really objective at first. I was like, okay, I know this is being narrated by the from the perspective of the biologist, so automatically we're in her head, and no matter what worth viewing everything from her lens right. so i was like okay well i'm gonna try and see like the benefits of what the psychologist is doing but i like again i much like joanne i have to agree with her i think the psychologist was a bad guy um and i for the same reason i think i think she was sort of put there um as more of a controlling aspect than really a benefit in any other way i couldn't see a benefit in any other way um 
and I didn't and I didn't really like that. So the psychologist became my least favorite character of the entire book, actually, for that reason. Um, and the hypnosis thing, the whole time, like I have a psych background, so I mean, hypnosis is is either you're susceptible to it or you're not. It doesn't work on absolutely everybody all the time. So I was like, okay, in that regard, that kind of makes sense. I I get why the author sort of did that. That's pretty cool that we get to see someone who's not able to be hypnotized and and people that are so i really like that aspect of it but yeah yeah and i think for me too i i, I thought she was uh, a bad guy i sound like a 12 year old little kid talking yeah, about yeah. that's in the bad guy but <laughs> yeah I, I thought she was a bad guy just based off the fact that like joanna same thing with joanna um just that the government wanted they there there was a mission going in you know and i kind of felt like that was like what joanna said earlier about none of their real names being known and it's just right. kind of you're a psychologist and you're a biologist like we don't want y'all chopping it up we don't want y'all being chummy chummy we're, we're here for a mission we're not here to gossip we don't want to hear about nothing so the least y'all know about each other the better so i definitely you know thought that you know she was put there by you know the southern reach to kind of keep them on task and making them be able to see what they wanted to see and do what they wanted them to do but it definitely to me was dope to be able to again see it through her eyes and you know see it through the eyes of somebody who couldn't get hypnotized now the thing that always threw me for this was the whole tower versus the tunnel then how some people would see a tower and then they'd be like nah it's a tunnel and from that point for me i was kind of like well is this the hypnosis? Is this just the way the world itself, Area X, plays on you and you really don't know what you're seeing or, or what it is? Joe, Anna, what did you think of the whole half of them being like, nah, we in a tower, the other half, we're in a tunnel or the lighthouse, or they just never saw anything the same? What did you take from that? I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the biologist was the only one who saw it as a tower. Right. Um, right. Trying to encourage everybody else to see that. But I feel like that... The fact that she was the only one that saw it as the tower is what made her unable to be hypnotized. You know what I mean? Like she, right. um, she had her own. She was a, a person with her own vision and her own ideas. Um, and and I think a tower versus a tunnel. Um, you know, I was thinking about this. Like, what are the differences in those two structures? There, a tower is usually one that you envision to go up, right? Um, and a tunnel is something that you go through. I think that's, you know, when you think about it like that. Um, and I don't know. I don't, I just, I, that, see, I think that and the monster in there, that's another thing. The, the monster that's in there, you know, that this is, these are things that didn't quite come together for me um, in the story. Uh, is it a tunnel? Is it a tower? What difference does it make? Do we get the answer as to why it's one versus the other? We don't, you know? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And speaking of the monster, we're going to get into that too, because, you know, I'm, I didn't, I didn't know. And again, I'm the wild person, you know, there's uh, so many, I just, I forgot the name of the movie. It's on Netflix and I watched it and it, there's no, reason or rhyme or reason so i'm like googling it afterwards and everybody's pissed like i just wasted 90 minutes of my life and you know from what they're saying is that the director just wanted you to come up with the answer that's like hey whatever you think happens and that may work for some people that's just not my personality it's like look you know i want to know why you know if there's a show where people disappear off the face of the earth i'm watching every episode to the end to find out why so when i don't find out why i'm like well that's a waste of time but i do i assume there are people out there who don't mind not knowing but portia what did you think about the difference between the tunnel or the tower or whatever yeah i at first i i was kind of confused i was like well what what is it actually because like joanna said a tower is something that we I mean, in the traditional sense, it's something that goes up. It's got a, it's got a ceiling, like it caps out at some point. A tunnel, who knows how long it can go for? Like they're just so different. How are, how are these characters seeing two totally different things? Um, and then the way that it was described. So, like, I think there was points where she was saying, "We're climbing down. We're going down." And I was like, "Why are you going down in a in a tower? Like, why wouldn't you go up? Or why wouldn't you kind of alternate?" Um, so I kind of, 
at first was like, okay, this is a tower they're going into. And then midway through, I was like, nah, this isn't a tower. This is like some sort of other tunnel. So I think the author actually did a really good job of playing kind of both sides so that either way you want to go with it, you can in your sort of envisioning what it's going to be. I'm curious to see how the movie is going to play out with that. Yeah. Um, because how are they going to do a tower tunnel? Like right. that's just how are how are they going to do that? <laughs> so. Right. And the fight. Oh, I'm sorry, Joanne. You got it. I was thinking at first that maybe it was a tower that got buried, so they are entering from the top of the tower going down. And I. Oh, right. Right. So so I was thinking that, but then when I looked through the pages, <laughs> I didn't see that described. It. You know what I mean? Like. Right. I, I didn't really f get a full idea of what they were, you know, what they saw, like, what's the interest to this thing? And I, I, I kept saying, all right, and I did what you did, Portia. I went back a few times looking for things that I figured I must have overlooked. Mm -hmm. And they weren't, they weren't there. <laughs> they just weren't there. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's the funny thing to me, just like what Portia was saying, it was dope how we freaked that because like Joanna said earlier, by the biologist not being able to be hypnotized, I kind of looked at it like, well, then let me believe what she's saying because she's the only one who's like, it's almost like if everybody else is drunk, then let me believe the sober person. Right, right. right. Who sees what it really is. But then like Portia said, I'm like, why you keep climbing down or why you keep walking down? So it, it almost what I did enjoy about the book was the author did a great job and just to shout him out Jeff Van Diem Van Diemer um, was almost bringing you into Area X too. I felt like he did a great job of doing that because I'm just as confused I'm sure as the characters were as to what's going on you know because like you said I'm like we going down but it's a tower and you the only sober one so I'm listening to you and now you confusing me so I I think the confusion may have been met to make the reader almost feel like you're in the book and you are a character and that this is what they're seeing and that this is what's confusing you which is a dope attribute to be able to do as a writer you know um to to keep you um that engrossed now the the I guess the the villain or the monster of the movie because I've seen the trailers and I see them shooting at something is the creeper you know, um, and because we don't get any defiant explanation of what the creeper looks like, it seems like it's changing from time to time throughout the book. Joanna, what did you envision the creeper as? Or did you envision the creeper? Or or what did you think about the monster? I, for some reason, I honed in on this one uh, detail that he wrote in the book, and that was the sludge that was traveling behind it when it moved, like the slimy stuff. So I envisioned a uh, a big slug, you know, or some kind of slimy looking bug that was writing on the wall. You know what I mean? That's how I saw it. Right. And that was the weird part that threw me. I'm like, okay, he's a monster, but he's tagging on the wall. So like, you know, I'd be like, is the monster like bagging as he goes along the subway tunnels or whatever? So that threw me to a portion. What did you think of the creeper? Like, what did you envision it as? Honestly, I think somewhere at the beginning of the book, there's a mention of like a wild boar or like a pig of some sort. Like a like a do you, do you guys remember that? Yeah. That there's like yeah that there's like so the whole time the whole literally the entire time i'm like looking for that character so I, i'm like okay is that thing back is that what it like are they gonna figure out that it's like this massive i don't know like mutated boar and and it's gonna like kill them or eat them or something so i just thought the whole time like i thought that's it was it was an extension or an extension of that or it was um or it was something like that, exactly. So that's how I envisioned it. But then things were like, you know, the slime and the sludge and the and the the, the weirdness that happens. I was kind of like, maybe it's something entirely different. I don't know. So that aspect I also really liked because that's sci-fi to me. Um, you don't really know, but something weird is going on and there's like matter that you can't really identify. And it's got like, you know, um, it's got like a side effects and, and things are happening, but no one really knows what's going on. So I thought that was a really exciting aspect for me. I, the whole time I was like, okay, what is this gonna do? How is this gonna pan out for, for the biologist who's inhaling all of this and touching it and exposed to it? So yeah, I, as for the monster or like the creeper, I 
I really just thought it was that boar thing the whole time, but I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> The wild thing with me, I didn't know what it was. You know what I mean? Like whenever I'd be reading about the creeper, I kind of just, one of the few times in life, I just didn't have any uh, any face or anything to put to it. You know what I mean? I, and because it kept changing, like I just, I, I had nothing on what the creeper looked like and kind of really trying to figure out why it wasn't attacking her. You know what I mean? Or like why it didn't kill her. Cause I'm assuming that's what was killing everybody else you know i mean i know she shot one of them but you know i kind of thought the other things were, were going down to the creeper tell me this when she eventually finds the journals of everybody stuff and she's reading her husband's journal one thing that stood out to me in the husband's journal was he was saying something about him and one of his homeboys saw images of themselves you know walking away from them and I think it was something like he was like, OK, we're dead or we're going to wait for them to come back so we can interrogate them. Or then it was like, well, we're dead and they're going back to the real world. What did y'all take from that? Um, that? That there was another version like this was where I was like, OK, like, Joanne, is this alternate universe or what? what so, Joe, what did you take away from that? That's what I thought immediately. It reminded me of I don't know if you ever watched Fringe. Did any of you watch Fringe when it was on no. TV? Mm -hmm. I, I, it reminded me of Fringe um, when it started to fall apart. It was a good show at first, but that's another story. Um, but it reminded me of that. And I thought for sure that Area X was some sort of alternate universe. I mean, why else would you see a duplicate of yourself? You know, and it was a, 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 a the entire crew, I believe. They were watching themselves. And didn't they go into the tower and, mm -hmm. and that stuff? when they do that and that i found interesting that they went back in the tower um i i i really wish and and unfortunately it looks like we're not going to get the answers even if we read the other books right because the way that the books <laughs> other books are set up we still don't know but i i'm sure that this is some kind of alternate universe or that the government is doing some sort of um experiments you know, and sending them there to Area X. Maybe the, when they go there, they swap places. You know, there's so many things you can do with your mind and make up your own ideas. Like you said, that's probably what he wanted to, what you to do when you read it. But again, that left me feeling a little shallow, that part of it. Just not All knowing. Right. right, I feel you. What about you, Porsche? Yeah, that, I think that's at that point, I was like, whoa, because the whole way through, I was like, no, no, no. Area X is just like an area that's that's sort of um, like quarantined off, and it's now used for experimentation. So it's it, I didn't see it as an alternate universe up until that point, and that's actually like kind of towards the end too. So as soon as that happens, when she's like, I found all these journals. I was like, what the heck is going on? Like, that's when it, the whole thing flipped for me. And that's when I thought, oh God, this, this is not like, this is some sixth sense kind of stuff. Like there's like some weird things going on. This can't be just right there. Like it's gotta be some alternate universe. So the journal thing threw me for a loop. Um, I really like that component. I like the way that was also written in um, how she, was I think she was like walking and she was she looked down and, and sees that these are all like familiar looking journals and she starts picking them up and realizes then like the way it kind of unraveled was was spot on for for kind of being that grabber. I, I really like that part of the writing. Yeah. And for me, I, I was thinking same thing alternate universe or what the husband was kind of saying. I'm like, man, it's like just again like Joanna said the author like leaving it up to your own imagination like i'm like okay then boom do you die when you go into area x and you know these are just you know you're dead and the 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 um the duplicates of you are the ones that go back or you know and then I, i'm still trying to figure out from the whole beginning phase of okay this is the if i'm not mistaken this is the 12th expedition so the other expeditions that came back with cancer or the expedition who you know killed themselves it seemed like it's something that drives you crazy in area x um and like joanna was saying you know we know with the biologist again who's the narrator we know she's trying to figure out what happened to her husband but again for the rest of these people like what's in it for you like it's like if you see 
there's a roller coaster and people are getting on it and everybody keeps dying and falling off then why are you going to get on the roller coaster <laughs> so you know it's kind of like for these other people i'm like okay well y'all the 12th expedition nobody comes back you know who the hell wants to go in the area x knowing you are not going to come back being the same way or whatever like that so um you know for me i just kind of i again we just don't know you know and it, it's almost up to each person to what they saw it as and to me that's if if it wasn't for the conversation i knew we were going to have i probably wouldn't have been as interested in the book but i was so interested in just seeing how other people kind of saw it you know what i mean with music we don't really get that a lot you know it's kind of like dope beat dope rhyme right. so you know whereas with this it's kind of like well maybe joanne is going to see it this way oh snap i didn't think about it like that and maybe porsche sees it this way and it's kind of it kind of makes you go back and be like oh well, let me check that again maybe that is a good point so i think knowing we were going to have this conversation made me enjoy the book a little bit more than if i was just reading this on my own and just kind of was like okay it's just you know stuck where um where i see it as the last part that really got me was i forgot where it was but i think it was the psychologist who was saying that area x was actually growing so that it, it was getting wider so again i'm thinking you know do does the government know this I, again we we just don't know we don't know but all that to say i would have to give this I'm going to go last. Joanna, on a scale, you know me. I'm old school. I'm the source five mic scale. Five. How many mics do you give Annihilation? I would say three. Okay. Okay. I would give it a, a solid three mics. Um, I, you know, I felt that there were things missing from the book for me to make it a five. Um, and not necessarily the open-ended questions because I get the open-ended story part of it, but the motivation for a character means a lot to me as a reader. I need to really understand. We understand why the biologist is there, but the other people, like you said, why the hell are you there? Like, are you crazy? Why are you going into this thing? You know, I, I just, I didn't really get that. And I also wish I, I feel like the world needed to be described a little bit more um I, there were parts of it where's the border how do you get you know what i mean the border where is it how do you get there how did they get there you know it's just kind of blurry what is that crap the guy's writing on the wall you know what i mean did anyone find it poetic i didn't find it very this the writing <laughs> nah, i didn't i didn't i didn't get it i was i was kind of lost because like i said I'm, you got a monster that's tagging the walls like are you not <laughs> like you know like so I, 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 you know that's why i'm going to give it i'm going to give it the, the three mics the vocabulary was good i did appreciate the backstory of the biologist you know and learning about her um but again i would only give it i would only give it three all right what's up with oh i'm sorry being generous all right that's being generous all right <laughs> all right portia what you give it I give it also three mics, um, pretty much for the same reasons as Joanna. I think there were some parts that were could have been developed a little bit better to give context. Um, but the reason, the things I did really like about it for me, um, I, I think solid three mics is is like a is fair, um, and I think that that's because the writer did do a good job at some points to um, introduce certain elements that kind of kind of like drew you in again like it seemed like right as it was starting to get maybe a little bit mundane or a little bit um you know it was kind of getting like okay now what it was sort of like a couple pa a page later there was something else that you you learned that sort of grabbed you again and then that was developed a little bit so i kind of liked that um and for me that's what i gave it a three mics for all right no doubt i'm gonna give it a two and a half um probably because I had higher expectations for it. You know what I mean? Um, I think because I had saw the trailer, I was trying to piece pieces of the trailer into the book and I just wasn't seeing what they were portraying in the trail in the trailer. I wasn't seeing that in the book. Um, and again, just probably just based off of expectations because I was expecting some ill story, you know, everything to come together and gel. Um, but it does get two and a half mics because I do feel like the author did a dope job of 
bringing me to Area X right along with them. You know, I, I can't hold you. I felt like I was there with them. I was just the hell as confused as they are. I don't know if the people in Area X knew what the hell was going on or if they got any answers that they were looking for, you know, because at the end of the book, Shorty's just like, I'm going to just go up the coastline, you know, and try to see if my husband's there. So I don't think they knew. The last thing that always kind of confused me is that Shorty never seemed to be in a rush to get out of here. Like, after seeing all these people dying and all this wild stuff going on, it seemed like she'd just go chill, eat, eat, whatever, go back to the base camp, chill for a little bit. Right. You know, like, right. not like, okay, let me get my shit and roll up out of here, because right, right. wow, like, yo, she was, like, chilling, like, <laughs> You know, like if I'm caught up in an ill part of Brooklyn, I ain't gonna be like, oh, let me go to a bodega and get a sandwich. <laughs> Stay here on the on the train platform. No, you can go and try to fuck out of Brooklyn. You know, and she was kind of just chilling. Then yeah. I, I didn't get the chilling aspect of it. I don't know if that was just meant that she had no fear of dying or you know what it was, or she came here for answers, so she didn't care how many people was after her or whatever, that she wasn't leaving, but that's the part that just kind of threw me because I'm just not used to people chilling at Camp Crystal Lake. Like, nah, I'm good. We, I'm going to find out what keeps this coming back every year. I, I would like to ask you guys a question. This monster did not kill her. Right. Why? You know? He killed the other woman. Did you see? This is, this is something that I, you know, I, I felt like she's standing there with the monster face to face and nothing happens. Are you kidding me? This is what we've been waiting for, right? I would think that would have been like the climax of it all. That yeah. they have some kind of confrontation of sorts, but that's not what happens at all. The reason, like, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, I think the, I think the reason, the way I played it out in my head was that she sort of connected with it through the um wasn't she like constantly feeling the the hum or like that heartbeat or whatever it was or like yeah and and she also breathed in those spores and i just felt like maybe there was aspects of it that she had and maybe for that reason it was sort of familiar so the monster didn't kill her I, that's how i kind of oh, made sense of it in my head that's great. That sounds good. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I'll go with that, Porsche, because I had no idea why. I'm sitting here like, <laughs> or kill the monster. Like, you know, like if you're not going to kill me, like, if the nigga I got beef with ain't going to shoot me, then let me shoot you then. Like, right, right, right. you done killed my crew. Like, so, but I guess that, that maybe that does make sense, you know, because I, I was stuck too. Like, okay, I'm thinking she gonna dip and dive this dude right. and then, yeah you standing there face to face and it's just like a Hi. <laughs> just like, oh, yeah. like yo this the dude i've been looking for all this time and i'ma just all right we good and i'ma just walk away so maybe that maybe that does you know bring in and and just then you asking that question joy and i'm like well maybe it was you know she wasn't maybe area x is all in her mind it just got my brain going down a whole nother mm -hmm. you know, trap door of somewhere else and you know again if that's what the author was going for then he did a, a, a right. very low job of doing that because just in that question alone had me open up a whole nother door of like oh well maybe it was this you know and maybe all this stuff was in her mind and that's why the monster didn't kill her because it was her you know what i mean the monster all this time was her because you read in the journals how she kind of kept her husband like pushing him to the side or whatever so I don't, I don't know. I can't call it. So it's going to get two and a half from us. Now, let's go into this because Black Panther just dropped. An incredible movie. I want to know, Joanna, what did you think about Black Panther? One, you can start off with how many mics you gave it and, and why. Okay. Is there six? Is there six? Yeah, well, I do it five, but I would give Black Panther six, too. So I, <laughs> There's so much to it. There's so much to it. Like, I... You know, I'm one of those who never in my life have I bought a ticket in advance. This is the first time I bought an advance ticket for a movie ever. And um, I bought my ticket a month ago when it went on sale. I was so excited. I didn't dress up, but I planned. I didn't get a chance to. 
Um, but it was much more than I expected because I went in thinking it was going to be another Marvel movie and it'll have some, you know, black people in it and this is going to be great. I did a little bit of research on the Black Panther comics because there's some things that I had that I'd seen in my lifetime but never really read. You know, I used to be really heavy in the comics. Um, and so I was expecting that story to play out the way that they, they, it was written in the comic books primarily, but I was, you know, there was so much more to it. There's so many layers to it. They, you know, there's the family dynamic. There's, um, the whole, uh, I'm black from Africa, I'm black from America thing going on in there. There's the, um, whole, um, just just trying to dispel those negative images of Africa and what Africa means and the you know prosperity and the beauty of Africa which a lot of people who are here don't really know they have this these ideas that the media has put in their heads of what happens in Africa that are totally incorrect and so I was just like yes let's have this let's show Africa and what Wakanda, although it is not a real place, you know, uh, all of the um, imagery that is a part of the film has been researched and it's, you know, comes from someplace in Africa, you know, even down to the language. So um, one of the things that really stood out for me um, was these family secrets. Um, the family secrets, how they can destroy lives in the family, you know. You know, I uh, felt like Killmonger had the outside child syndrome. Let's call it that. Like he had that sort of thing. There's just so much stuff in this. And I feel like it was just kind of like, I, I, I you know, I'm going back again, probably tomorrow, <laughs> probably tomorrow to see it again, because I, I feel like this is something that should be used to, um, I, I, you know, we already see the movement that's coming together as a result of this film. I mean, there are voter registration drives being done, you know, at these theaters now, which is incredible. Um, but one other thing that I really, really found having gone to the movies quite a bit is I think Killmonger was like the only villain that I agreed with to a certain degree. I found myself saying, hmm, he, he, it's Magneto too. I used to, feel, I, I was with Magneto. <laughs> Magneto. I, I feel you, you I know, feel you. They, I, they the villains that you like, I ain't mad at you. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, 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 right. Like you got a point there, Magneto. You know, the, the humans, they not, they not, you know, you need to look out for the mutants. You know, I get that. And I totally get what Killmonger's about. You know, and where his anger came from, I was totally like, this is, this guy is just, just great. I mean, it, it's, it's a wonderful one. I want everybody to go see it a couple times. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Porsche, which you, how many mics you give it and what did, well, let me say, if you enjoyed it, I assume folk would, not everybody might, but how many I mics loved it. Give it I watch? loved it. And I would give it as many mics as I could possibly give it, like an infinite amount of mics. I, I loved absolutely everything about this movie. I think it just blew every other Marvel movie out of the water. Um, it's, the cast is brilliant. Um, the, the acting is phenomenal. I think the women are just, perfect um I, I can't say enough good things about the the cast like it was just so well picked so well put together the dynamic that they had together was brilliant um you could feel it on screen you could see it um i just again like joanna said um i love that they actually researched aspects of africa and um kind of implemented those key elements all together to create this you know obviously this phenomenal place that's the best in the entire universe that has you know it's so rich in in all of these things because that's really how Africa is um, if you think about it right so I and I love that um and I think like Killmonger I I, I think um I loved his his um being there and I loved his character I also think that it was needed for sure um I don't it is a kind of a Magneto uh, Prof X type of thing, um, definitely, because obviously there's such a clash of, of ways, like thought process. Um, what, I, what I thought was 
a little bit abrasive was his language versus like like Black Panther's language. Do you know what I mean? Like the the street sort of American um, language versus like the eloquence of of everybody else. That was just sort of a little bit clashy for me. But I still think it drove the point, and I and I love that too. So I can't say anything bad about it. I think it was just brilliant. I love it. And I, I agree with Joanne. I think people should just keep going to see it. I think everyone should own it. Um, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, and I gotta give it an infinite amount of mics too. Um, and the thing is, is that I'm hard on mics. You know, me trying being an upcoming, you know, screenwriter and wanting to do this. And I'm extra hard on black movies. You know what I mean? Because I was seeing all the reviews and I'm like, all right, uh, are y'all just, are we doing this because we black? You know what I mean? Like, you know, they could have a picture of the cast on the, on the screen for two hours and people would have left like, oh, five mics. So like, I'm already going into it with the side eye, like, all right, let, let me see what's going really on. You know what I mean? But um, it's so many points. Um, one thing about Black Panther that I was worried about is most superhero movies do really well based off the villains they have, which is what I mean by that is like with Batman. The reason we're able to have an infinite amount of Batman movies is because the villains he fights are so dope themselves. The Joker, the Riddler, Catwoman, you know, they're the villains are just as great as the hero. Same thing with Spider-Man, with Dr. Octopus and Magneto and, and all those villains. And I was just like, yo, I really don't know a lot about Black Panther's villains or whatever. But um, I mean, and then the other thing was when I saw Michael B. Jordan was playing the villain, I'm just like, ah, I don't know about this. You know, dude is just the dude. From, I still see him as the dude from The Wire. You know what I mean? I, so I still see him as Wallace. So, you know, I'm just stuck. You know, the dude from Creed, come on, man. He ain't going to be no villain or whatever like that. And I was with you too, Porsche, with, you know, he kind of threw me with the, you know, what's up, shorty? Now I'm going to take that off you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but then the more the story opened up with him being raised in Oakland, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, this dude was raised by the streets. You know what I mean? So he's coming from a whole different world. He's coming from a whole different perspective, which I thought was dope. Like Joanna was saying with, with Magneto, because with the X-Men, I'm one of the few people who I never really looked at Magneto like a villain. I just look at them as two people, like almost Martin and Malcolm, two people fighting for the same thing, but from two different philosophies, you know, right. but... The outcome is we want the same. It's just we we going about it two different ways. So I never really looked at the X-Men really having a, you know, I looked at the Sentinels and stuff like, I almost looked at the U.S. government as being the X-Men's, you know, um, yeah. villain or whatever like that. Same thing with this. They wanted the same thing just from a different perspective. And it was funny when, you know, he became king. I wasn't mad. Like, I was like, okay, well, you know. This dude, you know, man, I, I don't agree with what he's saying. Like, we gonna, we gonna do all this stuff, but I understand the frustration of, of growing up in the hood or whatever like that. Two, the thing I loved about this was I actually, when I first found out about Black Panther, I thought Hollywood was trying to do a banana in the tailpipe with us. And the reason why I felt that way was because so many black directors was turning this down. Um, Ava Dunnery turned it down. F. Gary Gray turned it down. Uh, there was another black director who turned it down. And I was just like, all right, what do y'all know that we don't? Like, is Marvel setting us up for the okie doke or something? Is it like, okay, y'all blacks always want a movie here. We're going to give you the movie, but we ain't going to promote it. Then when it falls flat on your face, you can't say we didn't give you a chance. So I was really iffy about this. And then when I when Ryan Coogler's name came up, I was like, man, you know, dude is dope because I love Fruitville Station and I loved Creed, but I'm like, dog, this is a superhero movie. Like, this ain't this ain't just no boxer movie you shooting in Philly with Rocky. This is like, you know, the top 10. And I just believe dude knocked it out the fucking park. Like, and dude is only like 33. Like, to me, that's a kid. You know what I mean? So, to be able to see a young black director do this is dope. Joanna, just like what you were saying, about Africa and what people think. I was with my teens the other day and, and we were having a discussion about the differences between Martin and Malcolm's philosophies. And one of my kids said, man, I wish they would have just left us in Africa. His, another kid said, why would you want us to be left in Africa? We just be rats and roaches right now. Mm -hmm. you know? And it just opened up a whole nother discussion of, of what my teens think about Africa. You know what I mean? So like you said, just being able to see that, I thought Michael B. Jordan was dope as hell as the oh, villain. Oh yeah, I definitely. I I was like, wait a minute, is this the same actor? Like his his 
evolution as an actor is clear that this was something I feel like he has some kind of connection to it somewhere because um, also Sterling Brown was in this and I didn't know he was even in it. Mm-hmm. And his few minutes that were in it were very powerful, I thought, you know, um, I, I, I enjoyed that. Another, uh, uh, to piggyback on what you were saying about Africa, when I went, grown people, okay, speaking about perceptions of Africa, adults, grown adults that work and have children, you know, I, I say I'm going there and they're like, why would you want to go there? Why, why would you want to go to that place, that dirty place? You're going to Ethiopia for what? You know, this is uh, a mindset that we've been brainwashed by. It's definitely movies, stuff that we've been seeing in the past. You know, movies of the 60s, 70s, they just portrayed Africa and Africans walking around with bones in their nose and, you know, <laughs> playing drums. And it's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. So I'm really excited and I hope that this will encourage people to go visit, go and see what's going on there because it, it, it is a beautiful continent and I'm just getting started with seeing it. Yeah, that's dope. The other thing that I loved about it too was that it started in Oakland, which was the home of the Black Panthers, which right. I was a dope play. And then just even after Michael, jo- Michael B. Jordan became uh, the Black Panther, and he went back there to, and was talking with his father. I thought it was dope. I'm into this small shit. Like they had the PE, it takes a nation of a millions poster on the wall. Yeah, so, I noticed that too. Which, which you I would, noticed that right away. Which you would have been banging in 89 if you know, like that. So I thought that was dope. But I think the thing that I loved the most was seeing strong black women kicking ass the whole <laughs> Like having Naomi next to me and being able to have your 12 year old daughter see that was just crazy to me because she's not gonna see that anywhere else. You know, she you know, she'll see Wonder Woman kicking ass in the Amazons, but to see a man's army is black women and black women that again are kicking ass the whole movie, you know, was just was was to me something that that I, I hats off to Ryan Coogler for, you know, portraying that in such a dope way because there are gonna be a lot of little black girls who had no idea that they could fight or be warriors or you know protect people um you know so hats off that i truly believe 20 30 years from now we'll be looking at ryan coogler in this movie in the cast as being black history you know the same way i'm learning about matthew henson 30 40 years from now people will be learning about ryan coogler in this movie for black history um and again nothing i i literally one of the few times and joanna i'm with you this is the first time I've ordered a ticket, like a pre-sale ticket ever, you know, um, because it literally, I felt like this was like a concert. Like it literally was like movie film, movie theaters were being sold out. Like, so it felt like a concert. Like I gotta get my ticket now, you know what I mean? And you know, CNA would keep asking me, when's this movie? Cause like you got tickets two months ago. I'm like, it's coming, like just keep waiting. But yeah, like it felt like an event. Like it was an event, like to see so many people taking pictures by you know the, the the movie poster and like it literally was like you come out the movie you take a picture like i've never seen that before you know so it was just uh incredibly dope to see we're taking my teens to see it next wednesday it was dope to see so many people you know buying out theater so that kids from the inner city could go and, and, and see this and of course i love the end when they came back to oakland and he was opening up the center right there in the hood uh, you know, to teach about that. I thought that was, it was just a dope movie all the way around. So, you know, definitely, uh, again, hats off to Ryan Coogler and everybody involved because not just the director. And one thing I didn't know about Ryan Coogler, he uses women cinematographers on, on all his films, which I think is so oh, dope. I think that's beyond dope um, to see so many women. There's so many things that Naomi asked me so many times, like, Daddy, do women direct movies? And I'm like, yeah, you know, let's sit here and watch Selma. Let's sit down and watch Queen Sugar. Like, you know, Daddy, do women play drums, you know? And Lenny Kravitz's drummer is a woman. So I just love to be able to, when she asks those questions, for me to be able to say yes. Like, she's asking me now, Daddy, are there women producers? I, I, who's a woman producer, you know? And 
I'll take it to the Sheila E's and the, uh, uh, from Renee, uh, I mean, Angela Bofield from Renee and Angela and, and different women producers, but in hip hop, it's not a lot. I wish there were more, you know I mean? I know there are behind the scenes, but there's no name that I could just tell her offhand. Like I could say Primo, Pete, Dilla, Dre, or right, whatever, right. you know, but it's just dope for uh, having a daughter for her to be able to see that. So again, nothing but love for Black Panther. Joanna, give them all your stuff, Twitter, Instagram, tell them about the, the show you got in Brooklyn. Tell them everything you're working on. Okay, okay. so uh, my website is jwomedia.com. I have a live stream game show called Ultimatum that we stream on Facebook. I am working with a couple of producers out west on a few reality shows at the moment that we can't really talk about, but we are making content, making it happen um, on, at Twitter at Film Lover. Okay. No, no doubt. Porsche, give them all your stuff. Uh, Twitter is sh uh, at Cherche La Porsche, and Instagram's the same. Yep. That's it. That's pretty no, much no. it. Porsche, thank you for holding this down with me on, on the and, and for believing in this vision because I know it was a crazy vision. Because no, it's a great vision. Yeah, yeah but I, I know a lot. Of, I know a lot. Of, I understand my audience too, and they're gonna be like, "Come on, kill books," and I'm like, "Just ride with me, y'all. Just ride with me." <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, just so come on, ride. With yeah, you the know. Next book is a good one. So. Oh yeah, I read that first chapter and I was like, oh wow, let me just. It's the subtle, the subtle art of not giving a fuck, right? That's yep. right. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's great. Yeah. yeah, you don't like this one, Kill. Oh, good, good, good. Because it's funny. As soon as I was in a um, BT and they were going to the movies, and I saw in the bookstore, I hit Porsche right there. Like, yo, what you, what you think about this one? You know. So um, next, the next two months, I want y'all picking them. I don't Brody the first two months. So, um, you know, I want y'all to pick the next one. But yeah, you, again, all the people ride with me. Like I said, it, it's something that, you know, if you've never read books, give them a try. You know what I mean? I definitely, it's something that I love. And I mean, you know, I, sometimes I used to wait for movies to come out to get some dope content or now Netflix. Yo, know, you have an infinite number amount of books that are out there that are so, so dope that just pull you in and, you know, um, and, and join the book club, man. I knew it was going to be more women than men. We, uh, You know, because, you know, I ain't going to hold y'all women. Y'all more mature than us. Y'all y'all dope. Your women are just dope. You know what I mean? So, but I do want to get the fellas back in here, you know, so that, you know, we need more men read too. So we got to get that going. Y'all already know what it is with me, Kill889 on Twitter, NIG. We'll make beats for food. I appreciate y'all. I will check y'all out next time around, y'all. All right.